I'm Vabren Watts with Psychiatric News, and today we are at the second day of the APA 167th Annual Meeting in New York City. Today we have with us Dr. Nora Volkow, Director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Hello, good morning. Good morning, how are you? Good, and you? <laughs> Great. So Dr. Volkow, yesterday you spoke on the overlapping of neural circuits between addiction and obesity. So the first question is, how is addiction and obesity related? Well, what is, um, they are related in that the expression of the disorder is very similar. In one, you have the inability to stop taking the drug when you are addicted, even though you may not want to do it anymore and at the expense of very adverse consequences. And the same similar paradigm, you see it in people that are obese, where they are unable to stop overeating, even though they know that the consequences are very adverse. So you have in common in both of them the compulsive nature of the consumption of the reward, the drug in the one hand, and the inability to stop it, to actually exert self-control and stop it. So those two paradigms, the compulsive drive to take the drug in addiction or to overeat in, in obesity and the uh, inability to exert self-control vis-a-vis that reward uh, entail disruptions in circuits of the brain that are similar in terms of addiction and obesity. So the circuits in our brain that enable us to exert self-control relate to various areas of the frontal cortex and the anterior single leg gyros. And studies have shown that both addicted people and people suffering from morbid obesity have dysfunction in those areas of the brain that may relate to the difficulties that they exert, that they have exerting the control over the intake. Also, uh, imaging studies have shown another common um, change in the way that the brain is functioning, which is the sensitivity of the striatal system, the, the striatum the dop is where actually is regulated by the dopamine system and that's where you have the main reward center of the brain. And what studies have shown is both in addiction and on obesity, that reward system um, is not functioning properly. It's actually, it has a decrease, it's, there's, there's decreased signaling. And as a result of that, people that are addicted and people that are obese, when they actually consume the drug itself or the food itself, have a reduced response. And so it is believed that one of the factors that contributes for them to eat more and more and more is an attempt to try to compensate for that deficit. So those are uh, two of the similarities that decreases the sensitivity of the reward system that is modulated by dopamine that you see in addiction and in obesity. And the other one is a disruption of the frontal cortical areas of the brain that al allow you to exert self-control. So you start to see why dysfunction of these two circuits can result in, in a very malignant syndrome in addiction in a, and in a very difficult behavioral phenotype in obesity where the person cannot stop overeating even though they want to. No one wants to be obese. And we all know how to avoid being obese, just, just don't eat so much, yet it's not so simple. So why is it not so simple? It, which is the same question about the, the parents say to their children that are addicted or someone or a spouse, why, why do you just say no to the drug? It's so simple. It's very simple to us in whom our brain areas that uh, enable the regulation of self-control and emotions work properly. But if that doesn't work properly, it's like... Uh, being in a car with no brakes. You may want to say, well, it's very simple, just brake, use the brakes. But if the brakes are not working, then you cannot stop. All right. So you also mentioned during your talk about cue responses. And I think cue responses for me would be like a green sign advertising $5 coffee. So, um, so you said that those responses create compulsive behaviors. Could you explain what's going on in the uh, dopaminergic system? Yeah, no, and the, the conditioning responses are very, very important and, again, highlights that all of the circuits that are used by drugs are circuits that have been developed in order for us to ensure that we get the food and survive. And one of the most potent ones is conditioning, and conditioning you allows you to learn very rapidly to associate a certain stimuli or environment with the promise that you're going to get food. And that allows you to learn rapidly when you see an object that could deliver the nutrition that you wanted and desired. 
So it's a learning that occurs very rapidly, and it's a learning that not only allows you, per se, to consciously recall, because that's not so important, but it's a learning that even if it is unconscious, motivates you and drives you to desire what it, that stimulus is promising. So in the, the first one to describe this was Pavlov, and so that the animals salivated when they heard the sound that they had associated with the meat. So they salivate because the sound for them is telling them the meat is coming. And it will also, now we know from subsequent studies, they, that is driven by the fact that dopamine gets activated with a conditioned stimulus. So when you see something like the sound that, that predicts the, your cappuccino or the sound that predicts the meat for the dogs, activates the dopamine system, and that drives their motivation, drives their motivation to engage and make the long line on Starbucks to get your coffee or the animals to go where they, are, they know they are going to get the food. So it is um, a signal that alerts you and drives and engages you to want it and to do the behaviors that are necessary in order to be able to consume it. So that's conditioning. And foods do it. It's very important for us to survive that we get conditioned to food. But also drugs do it. And that is one of the aspects that make it very difficult to treat because you get conditioned. You get in an environment where you've been conditioned and you desire the drug, and you relapse. So because of the relatedness between addiction and obesity, you stated during your talk that some ex experts think that obesity should be added to the list of psychiatric disorder in, in DSM. What is, what is your take on that? I, I was one of the ones that wrote an editorial to say that psychiatry should take an active role in the management, screening, and treatment of of obesity as it relates to helping patients that have trouble regulating their food intake to be able to control it better. Because we deal with obesity, and I mentioned it yesterday, predominantly with its consequences, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. But if we really want to address it properly, we need to change the behaviors that are so difficult to change because brain circuits in the brain responsible for allowing us to exert self-control, for conditioning, for decreased reward sensitivity, have been disrupted by the exposure to high fat content food or high sugar or by biological vulnerabilities. We know that as you become obese and the metabolic syndrome starts to kick in, one of the things that happens is that you become insulin resistant, you become leptin resistant. Well, insulin and leptin play an important role in regulating dopaminergic circuits. And this, in turn, is going to affect the function of brain circuits that are of great relevance to psychiatry. And that's why my position is, yes, obesity is associated with a metabolic syndrome, but obesity itself is associated with changes in brain function that are perpetuating the condition and for which psychiatrists, because of our training, are in an optimal position to try to help patients um, overcome. Okay. So in a nutshell, a lot of obesity does start with behavior. Yes, obesity, most of the obesity starts with behavior. Okay, well, I thank you so much, Dr. Volk. As always, You're very welcome. speaking with you. I'm Gabriel Watson. We'll have more with Psychiatric News Live from the annual meeting.